Good afternoon. Um, looking at uh, wood fuel or tree-based energy, both charcoal and firewood, uh, from an African perspective or globally, there are two schools of thought. There are people who think maybe wood fuel, the way it's produced and sustainable, we shouldn't go for it. There is another school of thought that says we can make it sustainable because a tree grows within a human lifespan and it's truly renewable if we grow it sustainably and also use it sustainably. Uh, I just want to give uh, one case study based from a very local village level uh, perspective. Firewood collection. Firewood collection for use in uh, domestic cooking or in the homes. Women travel long distances, sometimes three kilometers, and carry loads of about 50 kilograms on their back for use at home, for cooking. And uh, this is uh, something that is women's work uh, is never done. They go to the forest, they come home, they have to cook, and uh, all that. So what we are saying is, can we develop uh, sustainable wood fuel that then can improve the well-being of the women. And then the question is, why should anyone care? And this is because when women spend a lot of time collecting firewood, it's their capacity and their potential that is going to waste. And therefore, um, a lot of people should be involved. Look at this aspect of carrying firewood. You can source firewood in a better way. If you had trees on farm and you're growing trees, for example, for timber production or fruit trees, they need to be managed. You need to remove the prunings. And those prunings can be used as firewood. In a very small village where I've done research, I found that some, about 40% of the farmers are sourcing all their firewood from the farm. So they don't go to the forest. And this gives them time to get the prunings and dry it properly, reducing effects uh, of smoke. And uh, when we are trying to do this kind of things, is that uh, at TICRAP, we are looking at it and also including some issues of gender issues into the whole aspect. And uh, because we want to improve the well-being of women, but also involve men in contributing towards that. And we are working, we have a gender a strategy, we are working, we have some training, some gender, and we are working with the different organizations. One of the organizations we are working with is uh, the in, uh, Wangari Mother Institute for Peace and Environmental uh, Studies, where I am a visiting lecturer. The other aspect, as I mentioned, we have some real issues, and we are not in denial. What we are saying is that uh, if Firewood is used inefficiently, it contributes to indoor air pollution. About 4 million deaths per year, mainly of women and children, but this is a global figure. But that firewood collection also has an issue on the spine of women, the injuries, and, uh, and so on. But then the thing is, firewood is used by about 90% of the households for example, in, uh, in Kenya or in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it being such a, an endeared or a, a cooking fuel that is being used by many households, its scarcity in any way affects food and nutrition. Such that you find that people reduce the number of meals that they cook. If they cook twice, then they go to cooking once. And then they abandon their traditional food. If they cook food that takes three hours, it uses a lot of fuel. So they switch to food that cooked for a shorter time and maybe not very nutritious. And then maybe they don't cook their food properly. And others spend a lot of income buying firewood or buying charcoal or buying cooking fuel at the expense of food. But they are looking at the way the wood fuel has positive benefits. It's affordable, it's accessible, it's cheaper, and so on. Then we need to do something about it. And there are some responses. There are many innovations going on. But I just chose one 
which I'm directly involved in and I have a PhD student here working on it. And we are looking at microgasification, such that you have a cookstove in the household that uses firewood and uh, it burns the firewood at very high temperatures with very low oxygen, producing charcoal. Charcoal from uh, crop residues like maize come from the farms or from coconut shells or from uh, prunings. And once you get that charcoal, you can cook another time with another charcoal stove. So looking at this, then we need to understand what is the energy use efficiency in terms of the value. And now this stove was like the initial one produced in Kenya, but then there are a lot of improvements going on to this. I've been doing participatory research with the cooks. And so they give feedback. This stuff works well, doesn't work. We need to modify here and there. And we give feedback to the industry and they have come up with something else. This was too hot. This is now insulated. And it saves 40% of the fuel. So the number of trips, the loads you are carrying goes down. It also reduces indoor air pollution, uh, as particularly particulate matter, which is a very big concern in terms of respiratory issues, and it produces 20%. Uh, out of the initial fuel, 20% is turned into charcoal. And therefore, we are still continuing with the issues of uh, what is the cooking culture to fit into this cook stove so that it can increase adoption rates. Uh, the other innovation is that uh, turning organic waste into a cooking fuel. And uh, you can do this in different methods. You can do this in very simple community-based method or in industrial-based methods. And this involves getting charcoal, the dust, the fine, very fine charcoal pieces that cannot be used, for example, for barbecue or whatever. And that fine is combined with a binder to stick it together and dry it in the sun. And women like just doing it with their bare hearts. They mix the charcoal dust with soil at a ratio of five to one, and then they compact it with their bare hearts and <coughs> dry it in the open, and then it makes an income for them and it's used in the home. The same thing happens in the industry where they have the charcoal dust combining it with a binder and then it's used for industrial maybe keeping chicken warm or for the tea industry. The tea industry in Kenya consumes so much charcoal. Two meter cube per hour. Uh, about 10,000 to 15,000 per year. And these briquettes are cheaper they reduce indoor air pollution, and um, they are also burning for a longer time than the, than the ordinary charcoal. And I just want to give you a clip of four minutes of a very simple innovation that people, women, are using in making the briquettes. And then you can see how can we uh, transform it to increase the efficiency, productivity, the quality of the briquettes to our partnership with George Washington University's Planet Forward. All this month, they are looking at how technology can help feed the planet. Planet Forward host Frank Sesno joins us now from Washington. Frank? Oh, hi, Emily. With nearly a billion people on the planet facing food insecurity, cooking fuel is a big reason and a big concern uh, for health reasons, impact on the environment, and cost. So this summer, we sent a Planet Forward team to Kenya, and they talked to a remarkable young researcher there who's developing a new variety of fuel briquette and looking into how technology can help bring this innovation to scale. My name is Mary Jenga, and I'm a Kenyan environmental scientist, and uh, I'm working on fuel briquettes so that I can contribute to feeding the planet. Africa, 400,000 deaths are recorded per year from indoor air pollution. One of the oldest groups in uh, Kibera in making fuel briquettes, they've been doing this for several years now. And now uh, what they do is they use charcoal dust, mix it with soil. Okay. Add water. They take the mixture and then they mold it into a solid block and then they leave it to dry in the sun. 
The briquette making, it is adapted to the different local situations. You go to the coast and people use coconut husk. You go to the areas where they grow rice and people use rice husks. You go to the areas where people grow sugar and they use sugar cane. This charcoal dust plus soil burns for four hours. With so little carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and particulate matter. So not only are they cleaner, but they are three times cheaper than wood, which is so damaging, and they burn twice as long. This is a win-win situation, Emily. Uh, Frank, I mean, it's a really a simple technology, isn't it? I mean, why is such a simple technology so important? It is a remarkably simple technology how you cook this stuff. One, as we saw, hundreds of thousands of people in Africa alone die from cooking with wood in their huts every year. They deforest in the process because they're having to cut down this wood, and it's more expensive than most can afford, so some don't cook the right food, nutritious food at all. So this simple technology leads to a very big change in the food chain. All right, Planet Forward host Frank Sesno, thanks so much as always for joining us here on Bloomberg West. If you have an idea you'd like to submit to Planet Forward, visit planetforward.org. And for more environmental and sustainability news, check out bloomberg.com slash sustainability. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.